Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the uh, NDMS pilot uh, virtual meeting. Today, we will be talking about one of our pilot sites and the projects that are ongoing at that pilot site, uh, and that is San Antonio. This is going to be the first of a short series where we go through each of the pilot sites. Um, before we begin, I wanted to make sure that I had the opportunity to talk about the CE credits and how those work. Um, so participants must attend the entire webinar and complete the evaluation online in order to earn credit hours and obtain a CE certificate. A link to the online evaluation system will be sent to all re registered participants who attend the activity that will contain instructions and a personal ID number for, for them to access the system. All online evaluations must be submitted within 30 days to receive continuing education credit for this activity. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that I put that out there at the very beginning for those of you who are hoping to uh, get that CE, the continuing education credits. Um, it, uh, everybody should have access to the chat. Um, as this uh, webinar goes on, please feel free to put any questions into the chat. Our presenters will not be monitoring that, but we do have people who will be. And as questions uh, come forward, I will make sure to ask the ap appropriate presenter that question. Um, this is an NDMS pilot uh, webinar put on by the National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health. Uh, with us today, we have Commander Michael Clayman from the NDMS pilot, uh, Joseph Palfini, from, uh, and Eric Epley, who both um, are with our San Antonio teams. Um, so I will ask uh, each of them to present themselves. We will begin with uh, Commander Clayman. Good morning, and thank you for, uh, for joining us on this uh, second webinar in the series that we're gonna be conducting over the course of the next few years during the life of the pilot. Uh, just to give you a quick history and bring you up to speed, if you weren't able to attend our last one, the National Disaster Medical System is a federally coordinated system augmenting the nation's ability to respond to medical. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Commander Clayman. It, it looks like we might be having some sound issues with your microphone. You are uh, very difficult to hear. Um, if we could just try uh, adjusting that quickly. How's it sound now? Um, about the same. Uh, we will move on um, and ask Eric to introduce himself and then Joe, and then we can go back to you and hopefully uh, we can work on that sound issue in the meantime. Thank you. So I will I will pass it on to um, Eric Epley from STRAC to introduce himself. Uh, howdy. My name is Eric Epley. I'm the executive director and CEO here at STRAC and San Antonio, the regional trauma and emergency health care system for 22 counties in and around San Antonio. And uh, uh, happy to be with you guys today. Great, thank you. And um, as a just a side note, um, Eric and Strack have been vital members of the NDMS pilot team pretty much since its inception. So we really appreciate him taking the time to to join us today and and lend his expertise on this uh, webinar. Um, Joe, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name is Joe Palfini. I, I'm working with the uh, field implementation team uh, with Deloitte in San Antonio. Uh, I'm a nurse by training, and uh, been in healthcare for about. Uh, 27 years now and uh, spent 20 of that in San Antonio working with Eric and the team and uh, happy to spend an hour with you all day and talk about what's happening in San Antonio. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, Joe also has been with us uh, pretty much since the beginning and has been instrumental in uh, the work done um, in San Antonio with the pilot team. So thank you so much. Um, let's try and go back to Commander Clayman, see if uh, your microphone is working any better. How does this sound? Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, I had to switch headsets. So uh, again, thank you very much for being on and uh, signing in for this second webinar in the series of what will be many over the course of the years uh, the pilot will be in existence. I'd like to just run a brief history of the pilot uh, in the National Disaster Medical System to give you a background, and then we'll uh, give a couple of slides to show you where we're at and then turn it over to hear more about our 
focus for this one, which is San Antonio and the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council. So the National Disaster Medical System is a federally coordinated system augmenting the nation's ability to respond to medical surges from domestic disasters or military contingencies. It's a partnership between the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, Veterans Affairs, and Department of Transportation. It coordinates a seamless continuum of care, including patient evacuation, medical response, and definitive medical care. Since its establishment in 1984, over 1,900 hospitals have signed agreements to participate in the NDMS Definitive Care Network with Health and Human Services, and more specifically, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. Over the years, segments of the NDMS Definitive Care Network have been activated to assist in over 300 disasters and emergencies, but fortunately has never had reason to be activated at full scale. Next slide, please. On slide six, we'll look at how the pilot study came to be and our progress to date. We're mandated by Congress to increase the capacity and capability of the definitive care network through interoperable means over five years at no less than five sites. Year zero or phase one in the timeline at the bottom of the slide was a study called the Military Civilian NDMS Interoperability Study. This was a study to conducted prior to the start of the congressional clock to determine the focus of pilot efforts in years one through five. We spent the first year uh, moving into phase two implementation. We spent the first year focusing pilot efforts through our field implementation teams at each of the sites at the site specific level. We're now in the second year of phase two and the lessons learned from our site tabletop exercises in year one were used to determine what our field implementation teams would execute at each of the five sites. Some of their projects include patient journey mapping using enterprise architecture, direct assistance to their respective federal coordinating center coordinators, helping them to revive their steering committees and authoring draft revisions to their FCC operational plans. We also activated a contract to conduct a high level health information technology landscape survey and health incentives analysis. We have conducted multiple interviews and surveys throughout the Department of Defense and all of the federal agencies identified to collect information and use that to provide a basis for not only a concept of operations, but a proposed functional requirements and overall business case analysis going into year three. Next slide, please. So here uh, you see two lines of effort for today. I'm going to just going to focus on line of effort one and more specifically the upper right, the site partner projects and medical surge focus areas. As mentioned in the previous slide, we uh, were focused on what we found out of the McNiss study and use that to drive year one initiatives. But now we've identified further that we have some major focus areas that we needed to have additional projects under. So what we did was we went out with our to our MTech consortium manager and allocated uh, an amount of money and went out with a request for project proposals. We were able to collect 23 project proposals and did an analysis and utilized our VA and ASPR partners to identify five contracts to be able to get after specific projects under those major focus areas. Next slide, please. So here you see a picture. Uh, once we were able to identify and bring on to active contract the, fi the, the five contracts that we executed under the uh, MTech project proposal initiative, uh, we also took additional, our other two, which were Deloitte and Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, that we're doing the field implementation teams and then the IT and incentives analysis. We brought them all together and held our first pilot consortium meeting in, uh, late in May. 
Uh, across the bottom, you can see the, the different contracts that we're working with, but today I'd like to focus specifically on the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council and uh, Deloitte, which Mr. Palfini will be talking from that avenue and how they've integrated efforts and working cross-site collaboration with the STRAC. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the CEO of the STRAC or Mr. Palfini, whoever's going first. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commander Clayman. So you can go to the next slide, please. So um, I think it's what's important to talk about today as we get started is um, really where we're coming from and, and why there's there seems to be two separate lines of effort. Um, so the Deloitte projects uh, that we're working on, the ones I'm going to describe here in the next few minutes, really focus on uh, a higher level, like a strategic uh, perspective for improvement of capability, capacity, and interoperability uh, in the, within the definitive care network in San Antonio. So San Antonio itself uh, is, is a pretty unique place, and uh, there's good reason why it was chosen as a pilot site for, uh, for the NDMS pilot. It, it is a thriving healthcare market. There's a little bit more than one and a half million people in the city of San Antonio itself and almost three million people in the metropolitan area that uh, you know, feeds patients into the San Antonio market. It's got an integrated military health system. So uh, most, most folks aren't aware, but the Brook Army Medical Center, which is located in uh, San Antonio, is an uh, American College of Surgeons verified level one trauma center and takes patients every day from EMS and in transfer from hospitals across uh, that San Antonio market. So the military civilian collaboration, that's really the target of the NDMS pilot program is in practice every day in San Antonio. And you add on to that the capabilities that Eric's gonna talk about here in a little bit, um, that STRAC brings the uh, trauma transfer system uh, with MedCom, the Emergency Medical Task Force, uh, and, and several of the other initiatives that made San Antonio a model for the nation. Uh, when, when you add that to this military and civilian collaboration, you, you really have uh, an excellent example of, of what can be done. And the focus of our work is to leverage the good work that's happening in San Antonio, but also to recognize that the best thing we can do is to take the good work that happens every day and use that as the foundation to surge uh, on disaster day. The building of a, of a duplicate system that's only supposed to be stood up on disaster day is, is really destined to failure. And that's something that I think we've learned, uh, it, certainly in Texas, but across the nation, um, following you know, any disaster, whether it's the COVID pandemic, whether it's hurricanes, uh, wildland fires, that sort of thing, we have to use the system that's in place every day. So understanding that we're building uh, we're modeling some of these improvements, some of these uh, initiatives off of what's happening every day is, is important. Uh, next slide, please. The other really tenet of, of, of our work is this continuum of patient care, uh, recognizing that the focus of what we do should always be on the patient. Right? It's, it's the hallmark of the trauma system and the emergency healthcare system in San Antonio. Uh, for the, the years that I was uh, you know, attending meetings with the physicians and nursing staff and the hospitals and EMS providers within San Antonio. It's one of the things that kept coming up time after time after time is that renewed focus on the patient. So if you look at this slide across the top, there's, there's five areas of activity, five kind of workflows uh, that occur during your typical NDMS activation, whether that's reception at the airfield, whether it's uh, EMS transportation, whether it's the use of hospital beds in the definitive care network, uh, whether it's coordination across local, regional, and federal government entities, um, that all of those efforts really tend to be uh, based in one organization or another. And one of the things that we're pushing for in San Antonio that we'll be talking about here shortly is the integration of all that into more of a unified command model, right? bringing the folks that are responsible for each of those components of a successful operation and, let's, and putting them all in the same room. So that uh, instead of a, a clean handoff, really, which is what a lot of us talk about is the goal of some of these operations is a clean handoff from patient reception 
to transportation or from transportation to definitive care, uh, we want that to be everyone's responsibility. We want, we want that, that unified command to be responsible for everything. So any issue that comes up is our issue, not something that is, is in somebody else's lane per se. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. I think the other thing that's important to recognize uh, as, we, as we talk about the work that we're doing is that it's based in the partnerships that, are, uh, that have been developed in the past and that we're working to improve as we go into the future. The, the partnerships I'm talking about are really uh, not just within the healthcare system, not just within STRAC, but if you, if you imagine uh, the, the state of Texas is a place where a lot of disasters have happened over the last you know, 15, 20 years for certain, it's, it has the highest rate of disaster nationwide, uh, the highest number of federally declared disasters um, by a pretty significant margin um, compared to any other state in the nation. So there's a lot of uh, good experience and a lot of uh, battle-tested processes that have been developed across the state of Texas. And it's our intention to leverage that good work through partnerships, either uh, reinforcing old partnerships or building new ones uh, to make uh, some of these processes successful. Like I said before, the, the FIT team, the field implementation team, the Deloitte work is really focused on more of a strategic level. And if you think about uh, you know, your standard who, what, where, when, um, that's what we're focused on is who, what, where, and when. And how to not just convene people that, uh, that have similar uh, interests or similar F lines of effort in this operation, but also to look at how that can be exported uh, to other sites. Being in communication with our colleagues from Denver and Sacramento, the National Capital Region in Omaha, as well as several other FCCs uh, across the country, we have the opportunity to look at what's working in San Antonio and how we could potentially uh, leverage that to uh, improve processes elsewhere in the country. What Eric's going to talk about later uh, as, as he takes over in a, in a moment is really much more of the what um, and, and the how that happens. So uh, recognizing that some of the best practices that are happening in San Antonio work really well in San Antonio because of the, the, the healthcare ecosystem and the relationships that exist. Um, and understanding that that, it, that may not be the case in, in, other, uh, in other markets and other jurisdictions. So uh, that's really the focus of the FIT team is to uh, to take some of these these ideas and uh, see what we can make exportable to other parts of the country. So what you see on the screen here is really a culmination of the first year of work. Uh, most of this is not surprising. Uh, the uh, the McNiss study, the uh, the study that Commander Clayman had talked about that was performed in year zero, really highlighted a lot of these and some other issues uh, within the NDMS system uh, that really could use some attention from some of the planners and uh, the FIT team and, and some others as well from the National Center to, uh, to try to work on some solutions that might improve those, those partnerships and improve uh, some of the processes that are occurring in San Antonio and uh, across the country. So these, are the, these were some of the themes that we've really focused on as we've moved out from year one and continued uh, with our work this year and going into the future. So. I think the ones that I wanted to call out the most were the uh, really the clarification of roles and, and bring those roles together in that unified command, as well as uh, is looking at what is occurring every day in the community and trying to align those efforts, uh, especially the way that we activate, um, utilize, and reimburse some of our uh, civilian partners in, in this sort of a, in this sort of an operation. Next slide, please. So we'll get into the projects themselves. The, uh, this is the first project that Commander Claim had touched on this a little bit. If you notice here on the left side of the slide, um, we've also called out some of the other pilot sites that are using um, these same uh, initiatives and some of the work that they're doing. So not only are we doing this work in San Antonio, but we're gonna we're pulling on some of the uh, the information that's being gathered and the work that's being done in other parts of the country as well. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward project. Uh, 
you know, collaboration and the coordination that occur that's really required for the NDMS operation to be successful is uh, is based in what's happening on the ground. Uh, you know, when, when the uh, when the event occurs. However, you know, we all know that success requires a lot of prior planning, and that prior planning is. Uh, is only improved when leadership intent and, and the leaders are involved in at least the setting of the course, right? It, and having discussions about what we should be doing as, as a community, how local, state, and federal government entities can be working together to accomplish that mission, and also understanding everyone else's uh, you know, needs during that process. And I'll call out in, uh, in particular in Texas, we're We've just started here uh, about a month ago with hurricane season, right? So that is hurricane season, wildfire season is a drain on resources. So having an understanding of the, the fact that there is an increased operational tempo in Texas in this uh, environment, having this discussion as part of the steering committee helps to move some of the planning up. Uh, activities and some of the discussions to other parts of the, of the year that maybe aren't as busy. So, uh, really, what's happening uh, during this uh, steering committee meetings is uh, we're bringing together, uh, obviously, our leaders, our leadership from STRAC and from San Antonio, that includes hospitals, EMS, uh, emergency management providers, uh, as well as our state partners with the Texas Division of Emergency Management, uh, the Texas. Uh, Department of State Health Services, and some of our federal partners at the regional level and FEMA Region 6 with our Defense Coordinating Officer, our ASPR and uh, HHS Regional Emergency uh, Coordinator, and the FEMA Region 6 planners to make sure that everybody's aligned on uh, with the direction the pilot is working on and how we can be supporting the uh, FCC with uh, the work that they're doing. And the uh, and some of the new initiatives that we're working on. I'll, uh, we're talking about the uh, the standard operating procedure that uh, next, but uh, one of the big efforts that we're putting forth right now is having discussions about reimbursement processes and how we can better leverage some of the resources that the state of Texas can bring to bear to support an NDMS activation. Um, but the methods that are traditionally used to activate those resources um, really aren't going to be sufficient to, to, to support those agencies that are assisting during an NDMS activation. So this is really that forum where leaders can weigh in on what's going to work best for their organization and uh, how we can work together to make that happen. Uh, next slide, please. So as we get to, uh, as we get the intent from leadership on how we can best work together to meet these goals. Uh, the next discussion was, and how do we how do we formalize this into a plan uh, that all of the partners can can use to activate and operate within this NDMS structure? You know, when required. This, as as Commander Clayman alluded to, the uh, the NDMS system has been used uh, many times in since its inception in 1984, but never for this uh, large scale combat operation. Uh, scenario that the, the pilot is really focused on. So a lot of our muscle memory is really rooted in this uh, domestic disaster response. And during that type of response, the Stafford Act uh, has been uh, implemented by the federal government. There's, there's funding available. Uh, so a lot of the plans have really fallen around a, a typical disaster response. And we recognize that those systems won't necessarily be in place. So during a, a combat operation and, and reception of military patients um, in response to that combat operation. So we're, we wanted to spend some time um, deliberately looking at this scenario and the, uh, the steps necessary to activate resources to support this NDMS, uh, the, the deployment of NDMS resources and the activation of the FCC in San Antonio. So, uh, initially, uh, as this commander had talked about, we looked at some of the operational plans that the uh, federal coordinating centers, the FCC, the, the uh, patient reception sites had developed. And what we found was that they were really focused on 
individual activities, especially those that uh, related to uh, the military personnel that were assigned to that mission. San Antonio is unique. It's one of six federal coordinating centers within the NDMS system that's operated by uh, the Army. And as such, there was uh, a lot of uh, discussion in that operations plan about activation of reserve component personnel that support that, um, that patient reception site and notifications up and down the chain of command. And, and it gets to be a pretty long document um, and one that doesn't necessarily pertain to all the players um, that are assisting with that operation. So we pivoted a little bit on this project and developed what we call, what we call a joint standard operating procedure. So rather than having a hundred and some odd page document um, that, that folks have looked at, but is, is difficult to use on, uh, during an actual activation, we wanted to come up with something a lot shorter uh, that really spoke to the individual processes, the communication flow and how we would operate during this incident, and then let the people that do the good work uh, do that work within that within that structure. So uh, this project is is getting close uh, to completion. It's in the review process. We're going to spend some time in the next month uh, looking over some of this work with our uh, with our FCC and our regional partners to make sure that what we heard over the last six months of information gathering is uh, is correct and that the the plans that we've written up or accurate and uh, hoping this serves as a model of really serving as a resource for operational personnel much much more than uh, a reference uh, for a, a large point uh, next next slide please the uh, this really falls into a, a similar into a similar framework as, as the last where we talked about the operational plans associated with NDMS activation. But this looks at more at the administrative functions that are associated with that. So as I said before, we have a lot of familiarity with the with this defense support of civil authorities, the domestic disaster response in NDMS. The Stafford Act is in place. There's uh, there's funding available at the state level to to uh, to respond to this sort of incident, to activate resources to support this federal operation. The, as I said, this the military patient movement scenario is very different in the fact that those funds aren't necessarily available. The, the lead federal agency is not one that's typically, uh, typically used to activating these sorts of resources uh, for an operation like this. <clears throat> so we recognize some gaps. Uh, we, we also recognize the fact that if you look at the document that we use to activate this definitive care network, the hospital network that uh, takes care of these patients, uh, it is a federal to local agreement. The agreement specifically speaks to a relationship between Health and Human Services and the NDMS program and the hospitals themselves, and doesn't really have uh, a lot to do with the EMS providers uh, or really any other uh, any of the other entities that are supporting uh, incident uh, the incident ma management itself. So we wanted to take some time to. Uh, talk to the FCC and talk to the community, talk to the state and local uh, response uh, personnel and, and figure out what their needs were and what systems would allow them to efficiently uh, respond to an NDMS activation and to be able to support this, uh, the reception and movement of patients into the definitive care network. And we're lucky in Texas that uh, there's a system called the Emergency Medical Task Force that Eric's gonna be talking about shortly. It's a state level system that allows the activation of EMS resources and response personnel to support an, an activity like this. However, the, the current reimbursement structure, the current activation structure isn't, uh, isn't really geared towards the uh, activation of dedicated resources. Uh, so this project really looks to, uh, to understand how that process would overlay the, uh, the current reimbursement processes, the current activation processes that the NDMS uh, system uses and how we could align those systems so that we can use a, uh, a process that's been, uh, you know, battle tested, like you said, uh, is response frequently to uh, hurricanes currently on, uh, Aaron could tell you they're, they're currently responding to uh, 
some tornadoes in North Texas, uh, and really is an effective tool that will meet the needs of the mission that, that we're talking about without having to uh, put undue stress on the, on the folks that are uh, responding to support that mission. So uh, that's really the focus of this project is the administrative support of that standard operating uh, procedure that we talked about before. So next slide, please. Uh, our last project is the, uh, the post-acute care project. And uh, Eric's gonna talk about a similar uh, line of effort that's happening in San Antonio. The, the focus of the project that the field implementation team is working on is really uh, integrating this post-acute care uh, network into the current unified command, into the current structure and aligning the communication processes, aligning the activation processes, and making sure that the case management uh, that occurs daily in the definitive care network to discharge patients from the hospital uh, to an appropriate location for continued care uh, is tied in to the rest of the response. Uh, we recognized early in our discussions that, uh, that we learned some great things during, during COVID and not to steal Eric's, uh, Eric's thunder for, for uh, later on. But uh, one of those things is that uh, the, the use of post-acute care, rehab, uh, long-term care, those sorts of facilities to, to increase capacity within the hospitals uh, was, was very successful during, uh, was to, during COVID to make uh, bed capacity to bring more patients to the front door of the hospitals. And we also recognize that during this military combat scenario that we're talking about, uh, there's going to be uh, increased needs for specialty care that is in short supply every day. Uh, things like burn care, things like uh, vascular surgery, things like ophthalmology, uh, and being able to use a system like the, uh, like the Unified Command, like the Regional Medical Operations Center to prioritize the discharge of patients from definitive care to free up beds that are in high demand as opposed to just whoever's next on the list is really the, at, the, at the core of, of this project to make sure that we're, we're using our resources as best as we can um, to allow us to continue to care for more patients that are being evacuated to, uh, to San Antonio and to other FCCs across the nation. Uh, we also recognize that uh, there's a connection between all four of these projects really and that this post-acute care network, uh, we can leverage transportation resources to, to move patients beyond just long-term care within San Antonio, but other places within Texas um, based off of some of, our, some of the plans that are being written. So uh, really this is, this is an attempt to look at, at from a, a strategic level, how to use the resources that Eric is building in uh, the post-acute care network, specifically in San Antonio, uh, to increase that capability and capacity within the San Antonio market so that we can increase our, uh, our ability to take care of patients. Next slide, please. With that, I believe I am going to turn it over to Eric to talk about some of the, the local projects that he's working on. Sir? Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of thunder there being uh, being grabbed. Next slide. <clears throat> STRAC is uh, our regional trauma and emergency health care system in San Antonio. Um, that's about twenty six thousand square miles. That red part of Texas there that goes out to the Mexican border, and uh, we have twenty two counties. Uh, one of them is urban for San Antonio. The rest of them are you know, metro or rural kind of places and, and three or four of those counties are what we call frontier counties, which the definition is uh, less than five people per square mile. So so a really diverse uh, uh, demographic uh, for our area to keep up with. Um, 70 EMS agencies, you know, two level one trauma centers, you know, the kind of normal uh, cath lab and uh, stroke center places, three of those comprehensive stroke centers, et cetera. So we'll talk about some of our, really the way we see in San Antonio, we have, we've, we've experienced a lot of uh, disaster response, basically hurricane and, and other things, but like you saw the Perryton 
uh, tornadoes this past week in Texas and then some others in uh, East Texas that have knocked out power. And we're just now last night finally demobilizing um, assets that have been on duty for over, uh, it's been 10 days probably. Uh, so th this is a kind of a full-time job for our disaster folks to pull EMS agencies and uh, other providers into a disaster response framework uh, regularly. You know, hurricanes are a really big job, but, you know, uh, sending 10 or 15 ambulances and two ambuses to a community um, for uh, evacuations and movement of patients and setting up treatment areas while hospitals are, are um, dealing with storms is, is really pretty easy and uh, that's something we do on a regular basis. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk about the projects. We have a regional medical operations center um, at our city, county, EOC, and, and actually the state uh, emergency management teams come to that same building. It holds about 160 people on the floor and um, uh, is a uh, really fabulous, about 35,000 square foot building. Um, in, on that ops floor, just off of it, there's this room uh, called the Regional Medical Operations Center, the RMOC. Uh, we physically bring hospital representatives, public health representatives, uh, the UT Health Science Center, uh, key individuals that we may need, EMS representatives, and we can work. Think of it as a, a focused EOC just for health and medical stuff. We're, we're going to take that as part of this project and put that into an exportable framework that other people can use um, if they so choose. We, we found it to be extremely beneficial, especially during COVID. Go ahead. Uh, Joe talked about our emergency medical task force, which I just referred to. And uh, this project was uh, initially created, um, I'm the chair of our state's uh, governor's EMS and trauma advisory council's disaster committee. And we, uh, uh, created this in 08 as a concept and rolled it out officially with funding in uh, the FY 2010 timeframe uh, after 18, 18 months of, of planning and, and uh, funding, you know, securing funding. And essentially, it just leverages the day-to-day -day, uh, emergency healthcare systems across our state. So we have eight regions, and each region has a full-time employee who's the EMTF coordinator, and they're Kind of the radar O'Reilly of uh, O'Reilly of uh, of their region, so they keep up with the MOUs. They make sure the equipment's you know ready to respond, but the personnel and most of the vast majority of the equipment are from EMS agencies or hospitals that we have signed on the MOU, and we we pay them, we reimburse the hospital or the EMS agency for 24 seven utilization of their equipment and their personnel. So it's expensive when we need it, but it's not expensive any other time because we're not paying for any of that. And you know, that that program has the benefit of no credentialing responsibilities or anything else because when they deploy on behalf of the state, they're still an employee of wherever they work full time. So their med mal, their workers comp, any public safety officer benefits if they were, uh, God forbid, to, to, to die while uh, on a mission, all those things are in place, no different than they were at, if they were at the state in station or at the hospital where they work normally. And um, we wanna make this, you know, where the, the agencies that participate is, it's basically cost neutral to them. So we even reimburse if, uh, if uh, the person who's deployed has to have a backfill person to cover their shifts, we pay the overtime rate for the backfill as well. So it really is a, a solid, it's expensive when we use it, but um, it, it's, a, it's been a really great system. We're gonna try to bundle that up and give that as a set of tools and um, some frameworks for other jurisdictions. If I, I think we could do this across every state um, and each state would be you know their own standalone thing, but it would look and smell a lot like this with ambulance strike teams and buses that can haul 20 patients, field hospitals, and, you know, nurse strike teams of, you know, different specialties, burn, emergency department, neonatal, whatever. Mm. Next slide. Uh, the post-acute care network coordination, you know, Joe mentioned in uh, COVID, we did find a great deal of surge capacity expansion when we, uh, 
organized. They basically organized the nursing homes and the LTACs and uh, really dug deeply into what their needs were. And, um, you know, there, there are other issues like the pre-off, um, uh, you know, moving to these post-acute care environments. is It's a different phase. And we're going to have to leverage some of the lessons we learned during COVID, I think, and try to build out what that next, I call it the third act. Uh, this is the first, this slide deck, uh, Commander Kleeman showed a really good slide that has, you know, kind of the three acts of this three act play and moving somebody from theater back, you know, back to the home and then, you know, care that's provided. And then, you know, after your care, and you know returning back to a normal environment i think those are the three sections and so many times in my history at least with the ndms program we focused on on act one and uh I, you know probably act two and three deserve at least the same level of focus and maybe maybe more um so that's what we're going to do with uh with that project next slide Pulsera is a um, patient tracking system that Texas has adopted uh, statewide, and um, it's used every day. Uh, one of the challenges we've had with the NDMS um, system, um, whether it's, you know, JPATs, traces, any of the things that are, it feels like we've got six different efforts that are, nobody really knows how to use on game day at the civilian side of the world. And so um, building out Pulsera, uh, which is, you know, pretty has a pretty big footprint in the, across the U.S. Uh, on the EMS side. We think is uh, could be super valuable in Texas for sure. It's going to help us because uh, you know it's free to EMS agencies, and frankly, it's free to hospitals right now. Um, at least for the EMS portion of it, that they talk to ambulances. There's there's a paid version they can upgrade to if they want for notification of their own teams and internally if the hospital so chooses, but basically the state has covered the cost of the, of the product um, across um, EMS and, and ERs at least. And so this system's been really valuable to track uh, each patient individually, but also give kind of a roll up summary about what's going on. Um, next, next slide. And then uh, finally, we'll have a big project to do a, a pretty major uh, functional exercise of all the things you just uh, you just heard about, and you know, following obviously the HC uh, model, um, and uh, we'll be um, you know reporting out on trying documentation for uh, guidance on that as well. So that's kind of it. Joe covered a lot of the nuts and bolts of the projects, but that's a that's a short overhead overview. I'm happy to take any questions. Next slide. Thank you very much, Eric. We really appreciate it. And of course, uh, Joe and Commander Clayman. Um, we do have one question here from the chat. Uh, I think that this would go best to um, Mr. Epley. <clears throat> uh, has the pilot helped increase FCC or NDMS engagement within the community? And if so, how? Um, no, I mean, I'd say that positively though. I mean, we, we have 100% sign on across our hospital systems um, for participation in the NDMS program. And uh, so we, you know, we haven't seen a, an increase in, in interest about it. I, I, I am happy that we're going to finally take a look at this post-acute care piece. Um, it's not sexy, it's not at the air, it's not at the airfield and planes pulling in and ambulances and teams running and yeah it's it's not that but it's really important and it's probably the thing that will make or break us uh and, and um i would probably not be as passionate about this if we hadn't just lived through covid and um seeing you know our surge capacity increase by 50 patients with one phone call in, in about an hour and then every day after that, able to discharge 50, 60, 80 patients a day. And, and the what that increases in your capability and throughput. And, and frankly, COVID really should be something that people study that they have very similar uh, 
uh, profiles. An NDMS patient coming back a war wounded. I mean, they're obviously not an infectious disease versus trauma, but but the, the the if you just look at length of stay and sort of resource utilization and things like that, very similar patterns to you know time in the ICU, time on a floor, and then time to be discharged and go to some other um, so, some other facility. I, I, we think, for, at least for the sickest patients, there's there's a really there's a pretty good similarity. And so what we learned from that was that the post-acute care environment, which they are not up to speed. They're not wired into this like, like I think the ERs and the, you know, the hospital administration that knows about NDMS, at least peripherally. I don't think the post-acute care world has the same level of understanding about all this. So I guess in that way, yeah, it's probably going to help us increase um, um, popularity or, uh, um, participation. So, so it's probably true. I didn't really think about including the, the post-acute care new partners. You know, at the end of the day, these are going to be TRICARE patients and we're going to have, you know, that's basically then at, at that phase, we're two weeks or three weeks out. It's going to, I think it could get slow. And I think that, that there's going to be some sludge that we need to clean out and figure out how to expedite that or else we're going to sink. Hey, uh, and Graham, I, I want to add a thought. Um, I, I agree 100% with everything Eric said as far as uh, as far as the uptake of the NDMS system in San Antonio. There, we hear a lot from other sites and from um, places across the country that there's some hospitals that don't participate. San Antonio doesn't have that problem. 100% um, you know, signatures on the MOA uh, is, is a pretty uh, big feat just in and of itself. But I also think there's value um, that the last year and a half has brought uh, and, and uh, of course i'll attribute it to the pilot simply because uh, we're having the conversation um I, I think this is a conversation that's kind of been long overdue the changes in uh the military health system as a whole the transitions to dha a lot of the things that are happening at the federal level um, are changing the landscape uh for for patient care in in, in this sort of an incident and so uh, working closely with the FCC coordinator and really expanding, uh, expanding the types of people um, that we're engaging, I, I think was, has been super helpful. Uh, the, the fact that uh, you know the original plan was when the F and, and this is a challenge that the Army FCCs have. Maybe this is unique um, to San Antonio and, and the other uh, sites that are supported by the services is that there's relatively frequent turnover in the uh, in the FCC coordinator. Every two, three years, um, that person moves on to a new post and a new person comes in. And you know the plan's always been give a call to Strack over and talk to Mr. Epley and see uh, you know kind of what the plan is. Uh, and, and now I think we're getting to a point where building a system where the FCC coordinator is really plugged into state emergency management, it's really plugged into the local system and has contacts at, at, within the FEMA regions and you know, the HHS regions to all the other players that are, that are such an important part of the NDMS system, I think is only gonna make, uh, really hardwire the NDMS into, into what we do, even though we don't use it very frequently. Um, I, I've been uh, really pleased with, uh, in our conversations with with uh, Colonel Linscombe, Colonel Kyler, Mr. Ross, um, over at Army FCC um, San Antonio, is th their interest in becoming involved in local planning efforts. Uh, just a couple months ago, uh, Strack had put on a mass casualty exercise that had to do uh, with with an active shooter threat, and the FCC folks were there to see how it worked and to see where they could uh, you know, maybe lend their lend some assistance or maybe learn something during that process. And that's really never happened before. And so I, I think uh, I, I think that's going to also help improve. I, it, I think it was Dwight Eisenhower right, that said, uh, you know, in his experience, planning is useless. Uh, plans are useless, but planning is uh, is essential. Right. It's it's the planning process that improves the relationships and that uh, improves our ability to communicate. Uh, I, I think the the pilot processes have really improved that. So. 
Great, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, this question is actually for uh, Eric or Joe. Um, has the steering committee helped increase interest or motivation uh, to participate within NDMS or with STRAC with uh, um, the FCC? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at that. I, we've, we've had exactly two meetings, <laughs> um, but I actually think uh, it's done, it's done less of that, and, but really served as a forum for having frank discussions. Uh, I, I think everyone in that room, uh, and we have a pretty good group of folks in that room, senior leaders with Eric's in that room, uh, the, the chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management's in the room, um, the response folks from the Department of State Health Services, uh, our, our defense coordinating officer from Human Region 6, our, we have a, a hospital branch rep from the Armock that Eric described, all those folks are in the room and they all have they're all pretty well tied into what the system looks like. They're very familiar with the NDMS mission. Um, but what it's allowed is really the frank discussion about, uh, about what's going on and about uh, how we can streamline that process and how we can better include certain partners and, and make sure that we're, we're taking care of each other so that we can uh, all kind of address the mission together. So it's been less about engagement and about education and much more about just having having good conversation about the way we want to get this done. So, Joe, Ann's asking a pretty specific question, like how how would you you know are we able to increase on the interest and motivation for anybody to participate? And and oh. I I personally people ask how in the world we're able to get all these people to come to meetings and you know do those things. We are the regional day-to-day -day trauma and EMS system organizers. So, so, so if the difference, I think, in a lot of other jurisdictions is there's like a disaster group of people, and then there's the day-to-day -day people. And in our region, and I think in Texas, by and large, this is pretty common, is that I believe the day-to-day -day system is, what's respond, is what responds in disaster. We're going to the same emergency room. We're just going to be busier. And we're going to have new partners come down and help or do other things. But it's it's like there's this disconnect from, in, in some ways, there's a disconnect between the disaster response people who, by and large, have a lot of you know planning and at the hospital, the environmental care chapters and all these other things. And they're, they're not, in my experience, hospital preparedness falls into two buckets. One bucket is taking care of the building and keeping the building on. And the other bucket is this, you know, these pesky patients that keep coming and you have to like take more of them than normal. And those things are incongruent. The, the, it's like the guys who try to keep the building on go, you don't bring more people. We can't keep the building on. With, we only have so many red plugs now as it is. What are you doing? Bringing more people. It's like, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but there's been a tornado and, you know, we're, we, we must have got tagged because this thing says emergency on the outside of the building and they're going to come here for help. So we've got to figure out how to do more with less. And, and if the depending on what side of the framework uh, your, your preparedness people in your hospital, you know, kind of lean towards that, that what I just talked about, that dichotomy, you're going to see preparedness people not all excited necessarily about this NDMS thing, but the care provider, you know, they've taken the emergency department uh, director and say, look, this is going to happen. It, it, it already has had, we've done four NDMS reception uh, efforts here, real receptions. So it's a little more realistic to us. San Antonio is the place that all roads from the coast of Texas lead to San Antonio in one way, shape, fashion. We're, we're in the first big city away from the coast. And so our, I think our mindset is a little more like we're going to be a reception point, whether it's people driving from the coastline trying to uh, avoid a hurricane or whether it's going to be uh, you know, an NDMS mission from something uh, that's happened in a you know a nearby state or something. So Katrina comes to mind. You know, we got thirty six, uh, you know, one hundred eight planes in thirty six hours. And just imagine, put that into your head, processing one hundred eight planes in thirty six hours. So um, it feels a little more real to us. Maybe that's the why we have better participation. Did that help, Ann? I don't know if I covered it or not. I, I wanted to touch on the MOA question too, because I think that was the first part uh, uh, of your question, Ann, is um, 
so Strack does a pretty fantastic job of getting those MOAs signed with the Definitive Care Network Hospitals. My understanding, um, and it is just that is an understanding of the new MOA that's come out is a little bit more um, open for uh, the inclusion of post-acute care providers. So um, that's that's the next step, right? Um, there's been some discussions actually at uh, at the steering committee level and, and during some of our working sessions about how much, how many of the post-acute providers actually need to be signing MOAs. There's a case management process, there's an insurance approval process. Um, so we're gonna try to leverage everything we can, but uh, we're certainly hoping to, uh, to in increase the signatures once that new MOA is out from HHS. Uh, so that we can have those folks uh, kind of formally onboarded um, with the NDMS process as well. I hope I hope that also that answered the other part of your question. Thank you very much, everybody. Those are fairly thorough answers. Um, uh, your presentations were all very well done, and we we really appreciate it. Um, I just want to give this opportunity for any uh, closing words from any of our uh, panelists. Um, we'll start with Commander Clayman. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Eric and Joe. Uh, as far as the comments, I wanted to add a couple of things that I think are beneficial as well. The reason that uh, it works so well and that we're we may not see as huge an increase in the definitive care partner network in the MOAs is Eric is centralized, passionate leadership. And that that's exemplifies Eric and what he's done to that area is a fantastic network. And it's a, and it's a model for a lot of what we do in a, the other sites. So a lot of the work's already been done there. What I will say, uh, in dovetailing into the MOA is it, yes, it was released within the last uh, few weeks. And there's a segment of it that we're really focused in on. And there is a recruiting effort that Asper has made sure has not only uh, moved over from the original version, but is really emphasizing now that we're looking at that post-acute care network and how we get after using their integrative tools to bring more post-acute care facilities into the definitive care network. So I hope that helps clarify, uh, add a little more to what they already responded to. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on, uh, Mr. Epley. Yeah, I, I don't have anything uh, else to add. Uh, I, I, but the MedMac thing caught me. I think that's funny. That's exactly what an RMOC, the Regional Medical Operations Center is. It's a MAC for medicine. Um, no, I don't have anything else. Joe? I just want to say thanks to the folks that uh, took some time on a Thursday to come listen to a little bit about San Antonio. I hope this was helpful. And uh, hope hope to... Hope that was worth your your time. So appreciate you appreciate you coming. Absolutely, thank you very much, um, everybody else. Uh, there is a QR code on the screen right now. Please feel free to use your your cell phones, your mobile devices to grab that QR code so you can visit our website. Um, we also do have a YouTube page, a LinkedIn, and a Twitter account. And as you can see, our our general. Um, email address is ncdmph at usuhs.edu. Um, please feel free to connect with us on any of those platforms. Um, and I also would like to invite you to keep an eye out. We will be having webinars uh, very similar to this for our other pilot sites and cover to cover the, uh, the projects that we are doing in those different pilot sites, um, which uh, each of them does have projects that are different from this one. So uh, we encourage you to attend those future webinars, and thank you very much for attending today. Again, please remember, if you are trying to get the continuing education credit, to keep an eye out for that evaluation. Um, and uh, I encourage you to, uh, to reach out with any questions. Thank you again, uh, and have a good day, everybody.